In this lecture, we're going to discuss optical aberrations and a few example optical systems. So aberrations come about because our theory has primarily been developed using approximations. One is the thin lens approximation. So a real lens, spherical lens, has some thickness. And when a ray strikes the lens, it propagates inside the lens and then comes out. The thin lens approximation assumes that the lens has zero thickness. It's just a plane at which rays refract. And the other approximation, which is motivated and justified by the paraxial approximation, is the small angle approximation. And this says that the sine of theta is about equal to the tangent of theta is about equal to theta. And likewise, the inverse sine and the inverse tangent are all about equal to theta. So that's very useful because it gets rid of all these trig functions that come up in the exact refraction equations. However, the real world follows the exact ray tracing formulas. And so we end up with the exact ray tracing results differing from the ideal approximate ray tracing results that we use in our pencil and paper formulas. And the difference of those we're going to call geometric aberrations. geometric because they come about from these geometric approximations, the difference between the real world and those geometric approximations. Now there's another type of aberration that comes about because of the fact that the power of a lens, we know, is the index of refraction minus 1 times 1 over the radius of the first surface minus 1 over the radius of the second surface. And remember, our um, convention that if the center of curvature is to the right of the surface, it's a positive radius of curvature. If it's to the left, it's a negative radius of curvature. Now, if you're using uh, light that has only one wavelength, monochromatic light, this works just fine. But if you have white light, which has many wavelengths, You've got a problem in that generally the index of refraction of real materials will be a function of the wavelength. And that means this is going to become a function of the wavelength, and therefore the power, and hence the focal length, put it this way, so P is also a function of the wavelength. And that means that an optical system with lenses will behave differently for different wavelengths. And this leads to what we call chromatic aberration. And by the way, geometric aberrations are sometimes called monochromatic aberrations, or the aberrations that, uh, that uh, occur even if you're only operating at one wavelength. Let's begin with a discussion of chromatic aberration. And we'll note that visible light has a range of wavelengths, which is roughly, we might take 380 nanometers. Let's put approximately equal here because it obviously, there's not a sharp cutoff. 
your eye is more sensitive to green light and becomes less sensitive to more and more blue light or more and more red light. So between about 380 nanometers, which would be in the blue part of the spectrum, to about 750 nanometers in the red part of the spectrum. Now, all real materials have an index of refraction, which is a function of the wavelength. And that results in so-called dispersion. There are two types of dispersion. There's so-called normal dispersion and so-called anomalous dispersion. Normal dispersion has the property that the rate of change of index of refraction with wavelength is negative. Larger, index, uh, larger wavelengths give you a lower index of refraction, whereas anomalous dispersion has the opposite characteristic. Increasing wavelength leads to increasing uh, index of refraction. Obviously, by the name, the normal dispersion case is the most normal situation that we come across. Now, you can use dispersion to good effect. For example, if you have a prism, and this has some n of lambda, and let's assume it's normal dispersion. Okay, so here's your prism. Then, let's get up some Uh, let's see, put a red light here. So say we have some rays coming in of red light, and that comes out at some angle out of the prism. Now, if, of course, if the index of a refraction was one, this ray would, wouldn't, the prism would have no effect. The ray would just go right through it. So as the index of refraction gets larger, uh, you're going to get more and more bending of a ray. And so for normal dispersion, the longer wavelengths have the lowest index. Therefore, if we go up to a blue light and this ray comes in parallel to the red ray, it's going to tend to come out at a sharper angle, greater angle. And this would be because the index of refraction at red would be less than the index of refraction at blue wavelengths. And of course, what this will do then, as prisms famously do, is to separate out the different colors of the spectrum. So that can be very useful if that's what you want to do. On the other hand, if you're trying to make an imaging system. Here's your lens. And this now is made from a material that is dispersive, say with normal dispersion. Then blue wavelengths, because the index refraction will be greater, will have a higher power and hence a shorter focal length. And you might see something that would look like this. If you have parallel rays coming in. There would be the focal point for blue light and for red light then it would be a lower power and hence a longer focal length and you might see something like this now if i put my image detector in the plane where the blue comes to focus, well, you can see that the red will be very blurry. Conversely, if I put my image detector in a plane where the red comes to focus, well, the blue light will be very blurry. I cannot make a well-focused image of all colors if my lens is built from a material that has dispersion. And all real glass, for example, does have dispersion. Well, how do we quantify dispersion? 
uh, typically and historically by measuring the index of refraction as a function of wavelength at a few different wavelengths. And the classic wavelength values are the so-called F, D, and C lines. Roughly in the blue, green, and red regions of the spectrum. Wavelength of the F line is 486.1 nanometers. For the D line, it's 500 89.3 nanometers and for the C line it's 656.3 nanometers. Why these wavelengths? Well historically those were wavelengths roughly in the the blue, green, and red regions of the spectrum where it was possible to build high quality uh, essentially monochromatic sources before the advent of laser technology and tunable dye lasers and things which gave you much more flexibility so we'll use um, that classic result that we use the index refraction at these three different values to characterize the dispersive properties of glass the classic way to deal with chromatic um, aberration is the form a so-called achromatic lens in the form of a so-called doublet. And that might look something like this. Here's a piece of glass with index of refraction N2, and then typically cemented to the front such that the adjoining surfaces are identical, you have a piece of glass with index of refraction N1. The front curved surface has a radius R1, the back curved surface a radius R2, and um, we've shown the case where the second piece of glass has a flat back surface. So that we have two variables, R1 and R2. And then we can try to form um, a lens that has the same focal length at two different wavelengths. So the first lens will have a power, P1 of lambda, which will be N1 of lambda minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. And the second piece of glass will be a lens which will have an index of refraction N2 of lambda, and that minus 1 times 1 over R2 uh, minus 1 over infinity for the back face, which would be 0, will be the power of the second lens. And they're in contact, and so we have that the power of the entire doublet is just the sum of the powers P1 of lambda plus P2 of lambda. Now, we know that each of those is going to change with wavelength, but hopefully we can find a way to make this so that at two different wavelengths, these chains, changes uh, cancel each other out. And maybe we can achieve that the power, say, at the C line is equal to the power at the F line. So the power roughly for blue and green light is, is the same. And of course the power is 1 over focal length. So how do we do this? Well, we just write the following equations. Let's just write down what the, the total power of this doublet is. It's N1 at, and let's look at it at the F line, N1 of lambda F minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2 plus N2 at the F line minus 1 times 1 over R2. That's the total power of the doublet 
at the F line, and we want that to be 1 over some desired focal length. And then we simply write that same equation now for the C line at lambda C, same expression. And we try to solve those equations. We have two unknowns, R1 and R2. So that gives us two equations in two unknowns, the two radii of curvature. Now, will those equations have a solution? Obviously, if the two pieces of glass were identical, so n1 of lambda is equal to n2 of lambda, these would just be the same equation. It'd be redundant, and it would not have a unique solution. In fact, it would not have any solution uh, in that case. But if the two indices of refraction, n1 of lambda and n2 of lambda, differ sufficiently that these two equations are linearly independent, then there will be a solution. Let's uh, take the entire system and multiply through by f. And then that'll give the right-hand side, which will just be 1s. And then we'll rearrange these so that we combine the r1 terms and then separately have the r2 terms. So doing that, we end up with the following 2 by 2 linear system, n1 of lambda f minus 1, n2 of lambda f minus n1 of lambda f, n1 of lambda uh, c minus 1, n2 of lambda c minus n1 of lambda c. That's our 2 by 2 matrix. And our unknowns then will be f over r1 and f over r2 because we multiplied through by f. So those are dimensionless quantities. And the right-hand side, we said, will be just ones. And we solve that and get these ratios. And then for whatever focal length f we want, this then allows us to determine the required radii of curvature. So let's look at an example. Um, here's n at lambda f and n at lambda c. And let's take a very common type of optical glass, called crown glass, BK7, 1.522 and 1.514. Right, so the index is going down as we go to longer wavelengths. And another common type of optical glass, so-called a flint glass, F2, uh, indices 1.632 and 1.615. Again, normal uh, dispersion, decreasing index of refraction with increasing wavelength. So if we just plug these numbers up here, that 2 by 2 matrix ends up being 0 0.522, 1.614, minus 1.522, 0 0.514, which is just 1.514 minus, minus 1, and uh, 1.615 minus 1.514, times our unknowns, f over r1, f over r2 is equal to 1, 1. And solving that equation, that system of equations really, we get f over r1 is equal to 2.357 and f over r2 
is equal to minus 2.095. So now if we choose a desired focal length, let's say we choose F is equal to 200 millimeters, five diopters of power, then R1 would be F over 2.357, which is 84.8 millimeters, and R2 would be F over minus 0 0.2095 is minus 95.4 millimeters. So now that doublet gives us a lens that has the same focal length, same power, at both the F and the C wavelengths. Now you can take this idea further. You can form a so-called apochromatic lens in the form of a triplet made from three pieces of glass. And this might look something like this. So now you have N1, N2, and N3, and R1, R2, and R3. Um, and again, we show the back face as being flat. You could, in principle, also give that a curvature. Then you, you would have four unknowns. Um, but this is enough in order to have three, three unknowns for three equations. So what would be the total power of this triplet lens? It would be, because these are all in contact, you just have the sum of the powers of the individual lenses. And at the F line, that would be N1 of lambda F minus 1 times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. And then the second lens would give you N2 of lambda F minus 1 times 1 over R2 minus 1 over R3. And then the final lens would give you N3 of lambda F minus 1 times 1 over R3, and then the back face with an infinite radius of curvature has no power. And that would be equal to some desired focal length F. So that would be one equation in three unknowns, R1, R2, and R3. Well, and then we would do this at both the F, the D, and then finally at the C wavelengths. Now we have three equations in three unknowns. And we can solve those. And now we have a lens that gives you the correct focal length at three wavelengths. Now you could even take this further. Uh, you could form what's called a super ap achromatic lens, a, a quad structure, four pieces of glass. So you'd have N1, N2, and I'm not going to bother to draw it, N3, N4, and four radii, R1, R2, R3, R4, and so on. Uh, as you get more and more pieces of glass, this gets to be very difficult to fabricate and hence very expensive. So a, a, a very cheap imaging system might have only just a single uh, element lens, which is not going to have very good behavior with respect to chromatic aberration. A better quality system, camera, might, would have a doublet, and a good quality system would have a triplet, and extremely high quality systems might have one of these quad systems. That's, that's the uh, most elements that I'm aware of the, in a commercially available lens, and this would cost, cost many thousands of dollars. But if you wanted the extremely highest quality uh, imaging system,
you might go for that. Now, in addition to just measuring at discrete set of wavelengths the index of refraction, another approach to quantifying the dispersion of a glass or any material might be to use a formula. And some a common simple formula would be the so-called Cauchy formula, which has two parameters. This represents n of lambda as a constant a plus b over lambda. Uh, this, of course, is going to be limited to materials with normal dispersion. Because in the form written, clearly as lambda gets bigger, the second term gets smaller, and so the whole index goes down with increasing wavelength. There are more sophisticated models. One that we describe briefly in the text is the Selmeyer, oops, formula, which has six parameters and is much more flexible. So rather than just having discrete measurements at a certain set of wavelengths, we might have a formula that we could use instead. Now we turn to geometric aberrations, and we're going to look at just one of these. Uh, and it's the one that uh, is, comes into play when you're looking at on-axis imaging, and that is called spherical aberration. So let's draw a picture of what's going on here. Optical axis, x-axis, and here is a lens. It has some thickness T. And here comes a ray. Strikes the lens, propagates through the lens, and then exits out. Let's say it strikes the lens at x1, exits at x2, comes in with an angle theta 1, uh, internally propagates with an angle theta 0, and exits with an angle theta 2. This uh, front face has a radius of curvature r1, and the back face a radius of curvature r2. And what are the exact equations that describe this process? Well, we worked through these when we talked about refraction. We would have that theta zero would be the inverse sine of one over, and let's let this be lens with an index of refraction of n, and it's in air or free space, which has an index one. So this would be theta zero is inverse sine of one over n, the sine of theta 1 plus, and then the, the phi tilt angle is the inverse sine of x1 over r1, and then minus that phi angle, inverse sine of x1 over r1. Okay, that's a pretty ugly expression. Okay, then you propagate it to this point x2, and then you have another refraction, and there you've got theta 2 is the inverse sine of n times the sine of theta 0 plus, and the, the phi angle there is inverse sine of x2 over r2, and then minus that same angle, inverse sine of x2 over r2. All right, so you got to basically calculate this first expression, stick it in here for theta zero, then you've got just an unbelievably uh, ugly expression to work with. Again, if you're doing numerical calculations, you can do it. Computer can do it. So this is pretty tough to work with analytically. So to make things a little more reasonable, we're going to still assume the thin lens approximation so that we can neglect this internal propagation, it goes over such a short distance that essentially, 
x1 and x2 are equal they're just we'll just call them x and then we're just going to focus on the effects of the angles now the aberrations are come up going to come about because in our ideal calculations we assume the small angle approximation so all these signs and inverse signs just go away and we get these nice linear equations that predict that we can make a perfectly focused image with a spherical lens that breaks down when we take into account the actual behavior of the signs and inverse signs all right the real behavior of a sign of theta oops sine theta is well the small angle approximation is that that is just equal to theta but if you continue on with the taylor series then there's a minus one sixth theta cubed and so on higher order terms and for the inverse sine yes the first term is theta which is the small angle approximation but then there's a cubic term one sixth theta cubed and then higher order terms so what you could imagine doing with these equations is everywhere replace the sign by its argument minus one sixth of the cube of its argument and for the inverse sign replace it by its argument plus plus one sixth the argument cubed and then expand that all out and keep terms up to uh, x cubed remember now x1 and x2 are both going to just be x here and what you should end up with then is an equation that would look like this theta 2 would be equal to theta 1 minus px which would be right, that's the ideal behavior for the small angle approximation and then there would be a cube term say minus a x cubed and of course there would be even higher order terms but suppose we can neglect those and just think about the effects of this term here that will be the aberration the difference between the ideal behavior and the real behavior now if we want a lens that has a particular power or equivalently a particular focal length so the power is one over the focal length we know that we need to have n minus one times one over r1 minus one over r2 is equal to one over the focal length and from that we can turn this around and solve for r2 and you find that r2 is one over r1 minus one over n minus one times the focal length and then the inverse of that whole thing so what that tells you is if i choose the front radius r1 then r2 is fixed by the condition that i want a particular focal length so i have one or single unknown that i can play with which is r1 now in our ideal uh, approximate analysis it doesn't matter which r1 i choose as long as r1 and r2 satisfy this relationship i'll get the same focal length for my lens but when we take into account the aberration it will matter different choices for r1 with r2 given by this formula will give you the same focal length but they will lead to different magnitudes of this coefficient a there and so different amounts of aberration So right here you have some maxima code that basically does that uh, those equations we saw on the previous board here i take the index of refraction to be three halves and let's say we want a focal length that is one tenth of a meter or 100 millimeters and we'll look at the special case where theta one is equal to zero so all the rays are coming in parallel to the optical axis uh, then here's the equation that gives you r2 in terms of r1 here are those uh tilt angles phi1 and phi2 inverse sine of x over r1 x over r2 here's your theta 0 expression here's the theta 2 expression and then finally we tell maxima that we want a taylor series for theta 2 in x 
uh, expanded about zero and including three terms. And here's what we get. So there's our, because uh, now theta one would be equal to zero, so there wouldn't be a, a theta one term leading term. And we get that theta two would be minus 10x. Well, that's minus the power, the desired power, right? Because the focal length is one over 10, so the power is 10, 10 diopters, minus 10x. And then here's the cubic term. And there's the coefficient in terms of R1. And if we plot that, here's the plot of that function. Now normalized, divided by its minimum value, so that the minimum of this is equal to 1. It's just a little easier to compare different values. Okay, so the minimum seems to occur somewhere a little more than 75 millimeters. If I make R1 smaller, well, that, the total amplitude of that cubic term goes up. If I make it bigger, it goes up, although not as, as rapidly. So you can then tell Maxima that, well, just take this uh, factor here that is the amplitude of this cubic term, take the derivative with respect to R1, and set that equal to zero to minimize it. So this would be a min at, if you do that, Maxima tells you that's at 1050 R1 minus 80 over 3r1 cubed, that's got to be equal to 0. Of course, then the numerator is equal to 0. r1 is equal to 80 over 1050, which is about equal to 76 millimeters, which you can see right there is the minimum. And then if you plug into the formula here for r2, you get that uh, to the nearest millimeter, r2, is minus 146 millimeters. So that gives you the unique set of radii of curvature that give you a focal length of one tenth of a meter and minimize the spheric, so called spherical aberration. So these are your optimal R1 and R2 values they give as many many sets of r1 and r2 values will um, the desired focal length and minimize the spherical aberration so this is why it actually matters what the radii of curvature of the two sides of the lens are, not just the, the, the difference of their inverses, which fixes the focal length. So here we see ray tracing results for the scenario we just looked at. Uh, the top one is the, the ideal with the small angle approximations and the thin lens approximation. This is a lens with a 100 millimeter focal length. So here are parallel rays coming in. The lens is at Z is equal to 200, and indeed they come to focus at Z is equal to 300. Come to a perfect focus. Uh, in the next case, we've got a real lens, the one that we just designed with those two radii of curvatures. Uh, and in this case, we don't make any approximations. We do the exact ray tracing, including internal ray tracing in the lens. And so here, the rays come in, they strike it, and they almost come to focus 100 millimeters behind the lens. Now, if you got rid of the rays that are near the uh, extremities of the lens, they would pretty well come to focus at the desired focal plane. Z is equal to 300. But when you take into account these um, rays that strike the lens right near its edges, they tend to come to focus, those rays tend to cross the optical axis a little bit before, and so you get something that doesn't come to a perfect focus. Now, I'll point out that this is kind of an extreme case. Remember, we defined the F number of a lens, which is the ratio of the focal length to the aperture. And we see here that this aperture is almost equal to this focal length. So this would be, a, uh, F number that's approaching one, which would be considered a pretty extreme case. Uh, but that's so that we can actually see these aberrations. So the result is we can minimize 
but not eliminate the spherical aberration. Could we eliminate it in some other approach? Well, uh, and the approach that can eliminate it, it comes about because of the name, spherical aberration, what that implies. Um, this aberration you can think of as coming from the fact that we're building the lens out of spherical surfaces. Now, you could imagine coming up here, for example, and saying, okay, these rays here are, are getting too refracted. The angle is a little too too extreme. So you could change the slope of the surfaces somewhat so that they would come to focus exactly 100 millimeters behind the lens. And that would allow you to eliminate this at the expense of a so-called a building an aspheric lens, uh, a lens that does not have spherical surfaces but has surfaces that are chosen precisely to eliminate this spherical aberration. For example, uh, in reflecting telescopes, generally you don't use a spherical mirror, but instead you use a parabolic mirror, which ideally, no matter its size, perfectly focuses parallel rays, rays that are parallel to the optical axis, to a precise point on the optical axis. Now, of course, there's going to be a considerable cost associated with that. It's relatively easy to fabricate and polish, grind and polish, spherical surfaces, much more difficult for aspherical surfaces. Although, with advances in uh, computer uh, machining technology, that's not quite so much the case. But yes, you could design aspheric lenses that would eliminate this. However, but um, there are other so-called off-axis aberrations. And you can't get rid of all of them. All right, so for example, if you have a lens here and you're looking at off-axis um, focusing, you get an effect that's called an aberration that's called coma because it looks the effect looks kind of like a uh, a comet has a little tail and stuff All right so i could get rid of spherical aberration but i would still have some coma if i looked at off axis imaging and so on so you can optimize for a certain set of desired outcomes but you can't get you can't form a perfect imaging system with an arbitrarily large aperture. Okay, you always have some limitations. Let's take a look at some more ray tracing results. These are all exact ray tracing calculations. Up here on top we have the optimal lens that we just designed that does the best job possible of focusing parallel rays. And below that we have a Plano convex lens in which we have one of the sides be flat that's the plano side and put all the power into the single convex side right this would be relatively inexpensive because we only have to grind and polish one side of the lens one surface and here's the same plano convex lens just turned around okay and now notice what happens here this is the same lens just in two different orientations we get dramatic different dramatically different results this orientation works much better much closer to the optimal case than this orientation why would that be let's take a look what causes these aberrations it's the deviations of the exact trig functions from the small angle approximations and those deviations get bigger the bigger the angles get so let's look at the angles here so here the rays come in parallel to the optical axis they hit the curved surface and they're at let's say relatively modest angles there and then they come out the back surface is flat and those come out at relatively modest angles so we have 
refraction at two relatively modest angles. Down in this case, the rays come in at zero angle of incidence to hit this flat surface, so that's perfect. Sine theta is equal to theta when theta is equal to zero is exact. But on the back edge, now we've got rays that are bent away from the surface normal of this curved surface. And so now we got reg uh, relatively large angles with respect to the surface normal here. And so we're going to get large deviations between sine of theta and theta. And so we see that, especially for the rays that are very far out in the extremities of the lens. Um, they come at much bigger angles than they would in the optimal case or even this, this Plano convex case. So we see kind of a rule of thumb here that we should have a curved surface toward the parallel rays. So here is a focusing system. You want to put the curved surface toward the parallel rays, the flat surface towards the focal point. And if you had a collimating system, well, it would just be the mirror image of this. And you still would want to have the curved surface toward the parallel rays. So by an analyses such as this, considerations such as this, um, we find that Plano convex lenses are pretty good for focusing and collimation. All right, so this is, this is the focusing case, and that is pretty close to what we got with the optimal lens. And if we just did the mirror image, flipped them over left to right, we have the collimation case. And Plano convex lenses can be readily bought off the shelf, and they're relatively inexpensive. And the other common kind of lens is the so-called biconvex, where the two radii of curvature have the same magnitude. So it's a symmetric left to right lens. Biconvex, right? That's so R2 is equal to minus R1. Those tend to be good in imaging systems with uh, the object and image distances approximately equal. That is a magnification that is about minus one. And so as far as uh, the convenience and cost, um, for these, these different cases, you can get by with uh, off-the-shelf lenses. Uh, and some other applications, and especially if you need, if you have very high uh, specifications that need to be met, you might have to actually have a custom lens ground. And of course, this would all be just in the case of monochromatic aberrations or the so-called geometric aberrations. If you also were doing this at multiple wavelengths, white light, say, you'd have to take into account the problems of chromatic aberration also. Now let's look at a few examples of important optical systems. The first is a simple model of the human eye. And so this will look something like as follows. We have two lenses essentially in contact. And in between, we have an aperture This first lens is called the cornea, and it has a, effectively a fixed focal length. And the second lens is called the lens, and it is effectively a variable power. Uh, the power is varied because this is a, a soft material, and muscles can contract uh, around it, or push and pull on it to make the radius of curvature, the radii of curvature be bigger or smaller. And then uh, back in the image plane, which is a distance of about, depends on you know the, the person, but on average about 17 millimeters, you've got the imaging sensor, which we call the retina. Uh, 
Now, because these two lenses are essentially in contact, the total power of the eye, P, is equal to the power of the cornea plus the power of the lens. And so that can vary, so it allows you to focus on things near or far, uh, again, by your muscles in your eye uh, compressing or relaxing about the, uh, the variable lens. In the retina, you've got imaging sensors of two basic types. There are the rods, which uh, are sensitive to basically give you black and white color in dim light and relatively low resolution. And then you've got the cones, which give you color perception. There's basically three different types of cones. Uh, and those are particularly effective in bright light and give you relatively high resolution. Uh, although the resolution is uh, especially high for things that are near to the optical axis and, and in your peripheral vision gets, gets lower. That resolution is about, we'll call this delta theta here, and this is, of course, a gross exaggeration of the geometry, but we'll call that delta theta, based on the spacing between the cones, is typically about 28 arc seconds or seconds of arc. Uh, a minute of arc is a 60th of a degree, and a second of arc is a 60th of a minute. So a second of arc is one 3,600th of a degree, or in radians, that's 136 microradians. And what that means is you look at a picture that would look something like this. If this angle is um, your 28 seconds of arc, or 136 microradians, and this is 17 millimeters, and that's your D2 and in your imaging system, and this is your D1, and say it's about 30 centimeters or 300 millimeters, then, which is a fairly typical reading distance, about a foot away, then the corresponding um, resolution in the object plane is 41 micrometers, which is about 1.6 mils, a mil is a thousandth of an inch, or if you invert that, you find that it corresponds to about 623 dots per inch. So it kind of tells you why a decent printer will typically have at least 600 DPI resolution, or preferably 1200 or 2400 DPI resolution, so that if you're reading the document, you won't actually see the dots that the laser printer creates. It'll look continuous. Now, over here uh, for the eye, Let's uh, think about the case when you're looking at something very far away, effectively at infinite distance. And in that case, of course, the distance to the image is, is the focal length. So we'll call that, let's call that F infinity is the 17 millimeters. And that's when your eye is relaxed, you're focusing at infinity and the corresponding power which is one over the focal length, is about 60 diopters. And then you can increase that power, decrease that focal length, again, by having your muscles squeeze on the lens and make its radii of curvature small, smaller, make it more curved. So in general, when imaging with your eye, you would have a situation that looks like this. Here's D2, that should be 17 millimeters, which is the F infinity, is one over P infinity. And here will be the object distance, D1. 
Of course, the imaging condition is that the total power of the lens is, which is 1 over the focal length, is 1 over d2 plus 1 over d1. Well, 1 over d2, d2 is the 17 millimeters. 1 over that is 1 over f infinity, which is p infinity. And then we'll say that 1 over d1, we'll call that the delta p, the change in the power required to focus on something that's not at infinity, but at some finite distance from your eye. And that delta p is called the accommodation of your eye. This varies with age, as I can attest. When you're a youth, a typical delta p um, might be about 15 diopters. When you're a senior citizen, delta P may, because your eye, because your lens is not as pliable anymore, gets stiffer, uh, might be reduced to only about two diopters. That means as you get older, it's going to be harder to focus on things up close. So if your delta P is 15 diopters, well, what is that delta P? It's 1 over D1, 1 over the distance at which you can focus on something. And so that D1 would be 1 over 15, which is about, works out to be about 7 centimeters. Okay, so a, a youth with very healthy eyes might be able to hold something only about 7 centimeters from their face and actually focus on it. If you're an older person like myself and you have a delta P of only about two, well, that gives you a D1, only about half a meter or 50 centimeters. You may have seen uh, senior citizens trying to read, I don't know, the ingredients on a box of cereal and they hold it out at arm's length because they can't focus on it up close. Of course, the problem then is as you hold it farther away from your face, this D1 gets bigger the magnification is minus D2 over D1, and that gets smaller, so it gets harder and harder to read. That's one reason why uh, sometimes books will be printed in so-called large type format so that older people can hold it 50 centimeters away from their face and still read it because the type is bigger. Of course, the other option is just to wear reading glasses. Let's take as a... typical reading distance um, about 25 centimeters okay so that would give you so if your d1 is 25 centimeters one over that gives you your delta p which with this conveniently chosen number is four diopters. Then the magnification is gonna be minus D2 over D1, which is, well, let's see. D2 is one over P infinity. And D1 well, that's 1 over delta P. So 1 over D1 is delta P, and so this becomes minus delta P, and then D2 is 1 over P infinity. So there's your magnification. So in the, uh, the case of, um, of the youth with 15 diopters of accommodation, you'd have... 15 over p infinity, which is about 60. And that's just in magnitude here, forget the minus sign, a magnification about a fourth. In other words, they can make an image such that the size of the image on the retina is one fourth of the actual size of the object. Whereas a senior citizen with an accommodation of only two diopters, two over 60 is a 30th. So now they can only make an image that is one 30th the size of the original object. So they can't see things as well. They can't focus in uh, on as small of objects.
Now, let's talk about a solution for limited accommodation of the eye, the magnifying lens. sometimes called the magnifying glass. And I'm not going to try to draw this, so I just pulled the image out of the PDF notes here. So this is, this is the idea. So in a normal imaging system that creates a real image, we'd have a situation that would look like this. All the rays that leave from one point on the object focus to one point in the image. Here's D1, here's D2, and the imaging condition is that 1 over F is 1 over D1 plus 1 over D2. We solved this previously for D2. Uh, it's D1 times F over D1 minus F. Now, if D1 is less than F, then the denominator is a negative number. And that means that D2 is negative. In other words, the image is not to the right of the lens, it's to the left of the lens, and that's shown, shown here. Here's an object. It's at a distance D1, which is less than F in front of the lens, and the so-called virtual image, which is formed, is to the left of the image. Now it's virtual because there's no place you can actually put a piece of film or an imaging sensor and capture this image, but you can image it with your eye. And that's the principle of the magnifying lens. Right, uh, in this case, because right, the magnification is minus D2 over D1, and since D1 is less than F, that which makes D2 negative, D2 is negative, so negative, negative is positive. This is positive, and the image, as shown here, is upright. So when you look at it with your eye, you will see it, the upright image, uh, it will just be larger. Now, suppose, uh, and what you would typically do with a magnifying lens is you would arrange things so that this virtual image uh, was a distance D2. Imagine your eye is right up at the magnifying lens. So this is essentially the distance from your eye. Uh, so the, this D2 uh, in magnitude is equal to the D min of your eye, the closest you can focus on something. So that D min is minus D2. So over here, this magnification is minus D2 is just D min then over D1. So what you could in principle do um, is use a different focal length so that you can make this D1 as small as necessary. This D min is fixed by your ability, your accommodation of your eye. But then you can make this D1 smaller and smaller so this magnification gets bigger and bigger. Right? So what's going on is if I had infinite accommodation, I could just put my eye as close as I needed to do this object to see it as large as I want to. But my eye has limited accommodation, so I can only get things to within D min of my eye. So if I put this little object D min away, it would be appear very small. Instead, I use this magnifying system to create a virtual image, which is at a distance D min, and that virtual image is this much bigger than the actual object, so I see it much larger than I would see if I put the actual object at the D-min from my eye. In fact, we can write that uh, 1 over the focal length of this lens will be equal to 1 over D1 plus 1 over D2, uh, but D2 is minus D-min, so that would be minus 1 over D min, and you can solve that for the required focal length f, it's D min over the magnification minus one. Because we can write up here, here's your D2, divide that by D1, that just gets rid of this D1 factor there. And so your magnification, another form for that is that it would just simply be 
f over and the minus sign then would be obtained by negating the denominator f minus d1. And so if you take that guy and you subtract one from it and then divide that into d min, you get this focal length. The focal length of the magnifying lens that's required to get you a particular magnification when your eye can accommodate a certain d min object distance. And we can turn that around and solve it for the magnification. M then is equal to 1 plus d min over f. So for example, let's say your d min is 25 centimeters. Uh, and you have a lens with a focal length of 100 millimeters or 10 centimeters. That would give you 2.5 plus 1 is a magnification of 3.5. So that would allow you to see this object 3.5 times as large as you could ever see it with your naked eye. Finally, let's talk about the microscope. Now in principle, based on the formulas we just had on the previous board, you could uh, have a magnifying glass with a focal length that would allow you to achieve an arbitrarily large magnification. But that would require ever smaller focal lengths, and that requires ever smaller radii of curvature of the lens, which would mean you would end up having ever larger angles with respect to the surface normal for the uh, refraction of rays, and aberrations would get out of control. So there's actually a practical limit to that. The solution is shown here. It's the microscope. This is a combination of an imaging lens, a real imaging lens, plus a magnifying glass or magnifying lens. So this is illustrated down here. Here we've got a lens of focal length f1. That's called the objective lens. It's near the object. And here's the lens of focal length f2. That is the eyepiece, which goes near to your eye. And the objective usually is a very high quality of lens of relatively small focal length f1. And here's d1, object distance, d2, image distance. And our formula for d2 is that it's equal to d1f over d1 minus f. And the magnification, we'll call m1, the first magnification of the, in the system, is minus d2 over d1, uh, which dividing d1 here just gets rid of that factor, and that becomes minus f over d1 minus f. And so as d1 approaches f, this can be arbitrarily large in magnitude. And typically, if you ever use the microscope, you get the objective lens really close to the uh, specimen you're looking at. Uh, so it's got a very small focal length, and you get really close to that focal length, so this can be a very large number. Then that creates a real image here. Now, if you were making an electronic uh, digital microscope, you could just put an imaging sensor there and capture that. But if you want to look at it with your eye, what you typically would do then is then use a magnifying lens to make a virtual image of that real image and get additional magnification through that process. So that gives you a magnification, let's call it M2 for the second lens, which is one plus D min for your eye. That's your due to your accommodation of your eye over the focal length of the eyepiece, F2. And let's assume that's much bigger than one, so we can neglect the one in the one plus there, and that's about equal to D min over F2. And if we put those together, the entire system has a magnification, which is minus D2 over D1 times the D min of your eye over F2, or plugging in this formula here. And again, the minus sign means that you will see things upside down. It will be inverted. Um, let's put in this formula here. That would be then 
minus F1 over D1 minus F1 D min uh, over F2. Uh, so you get a magnification for the whole system that is a product of these two magnifications. So if they're each 10 in magnitude, well, then the whole system has a magnification of 100, uh, which would not be practical to get with a single lens alone due to the limitations you get into because of aberrations.